Please take your copy of God's Word and turn with me to Genesis chapter 21. Genesis chapter 21. For 10 chapters or so, we have been following this story of Abraham. God had promised he would be a great nation, have a great name, and all the families of the earth would be blessed through him. Of course, to be a great nation means he has children and land, and we've seen he hasn't had either. How is God going to keep his promise? Well, here in this chapter, we see how God keeps his promises, but even more, in those times when we are tempted to think that God has forgotten us, That God has forgotten to keep his promises to us. What this passage in God's word tells us is, no, God's not forgotten you. God remembers you. He cannot forget you and won't. I don't know about you this morning, but I need to hear that. So let's ask God to help us, to help us to hear his word today. Would you pray with me? Almighty God, we do ask that you would give us ears to hear eyes to see and heart to believe this gospel. Lord, we know that only happens through the work of your Holy Spirit. So Holy Spirit, we pray, come and do this work in us. Speak to us in and through Holy Scripture, we pray. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. So Genesis chapter 21, beginning in verse 1. The Lord visited Sarah, as he had said, and the Lord did to Sarah as he had Promised, and Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age, at the time of which God had spoken to him. Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him, whom Sarah bore him, Isaac. And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old, as God commanded him. Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. And Sarah said, God has made laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh over me. And she said, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. And the child grew and was weaned. And Abraham made a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. But Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abraham, laughing. So she said to Abraham, cast out this slave woman with her son, for the son of the slave woman shall not be heir with my son, Isaac. And the thing was very displeasing to Abraham on account of his son. But God said to Abraham, be not displeased because of the boy and because of your slave woman. Whatever Sarah says to you, do as she tells you, for through Isaac shall your offspring be named. And I will make a nation of the son of the slave woman also because he is your offspring. So Abraham rose early in the morning and took bread and a skin of water and gave it to Hagar, putting it on her shoulder along with the child and sent her away. And she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. When the water in the skin was gone, she put the child under one of the bushes. Then she went and sat down opposite him a good way off about the distance of a bow shot. For she said, let me not look on the death of the child. And as she sat opposite him, she lifted her voice and wept, and God heard the voice of the boy. And the angel of the God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What troubles you, Hagar? Fear not, for God has heard the voice of the boy where he is. Up, lift up the boy, and hold him fast with your hand, for I will make him into a great nation. Then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. And she went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. And God was with the boy, and he grew up. He lived in the wilderness and became an expert with the bow. He lived in the wilderness of Paran, and his mother took a wife for him from the land of Egypt. At that time, Abimelech and Philcol, the commander of his army, said to Abraham, God is with you in all that you do. Now therefore swear to me here by God that you will not deal falsely with me or with my descendants or with my posterity, but as I have dealt kindly with you, so you will deal with me and with the land where you have sojourned. And Abraham said, I will swear. When Abraham reproved Abimelech about a well of water that Abimelech's servants had seized, Abimelech said, I do not know who has done this thing. You did not tell me and I have not heard of it until today. 
So Abraham took sheep and oxen and gave them to Abimelech, and the two men made a covenant. Abraham set seven ewe lambs of the flock apart, and Abimelech said to Abraham, What is the meaning of these seven ewe lambs that you have set apart? He said, These seven ewe lambs you will take from my hand, that this may be a witness for me that I dug this well. Therefore the place was called Beersheba, because there both of them swore an oath. So they made covenant at Beersheba. Then Abimelech and Philcol, the commander of his army, rose up and returned to the land of the Philistines. Abraham planted a tamarisk tree in Beersheba and called there on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. And Abraham sojourned many days in the land of the Philistines. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So I've been noticing recently as I'm cresting towards 50, I turn 50 next month, that I've started to struggle to remember stuff. I mean, I, I used to be able to hold wide and disparate pieces of information, chief among which were all the key batting averages from key baseball players in the 1980s and 90s, and can remember them and regurgitate them at a drop of a hat, and now I can't hardly remember anything. I, I could, used to be able to to take something that was mentioned to me that I needed to do and hold it in my head for hours and still remember to execute it. Or, or I could see someone's face and remember them. And though I may not be able to pull their name immediately, I would eventually say, oh, that's who that was and pull their name. But, but now I find myself forgetting all kinds of things I used to remember easy peasy. Uh, I suspect it's a, a combination of, of having too much to remember and perhaps of getting older, but you know how that is. It's, it's disconcerting. It's frustrating to forget. And as frustrating as it is when we forget, whether the commonplace kinds of forgetting or, or the more serious kinds that comes with a, a medical diagnosis, it's, it's even more disconcerting and frustrating when those whom we love seem to forget us. A couple of years ago, a PCA pastor friend of mine was passing through town on his way to Jacksonville, Florida, and he was going to check on his dad. His dad was in his early 90s, and he was dealing with advancing dementia. And as we had coffee there in Starbucks, my friend told me that he was fully expecting that at one of these visits, his father would no longer recognize him. But I don't think as we sat there at Starbucks that he was expecting that day to be the day. As he emailed me after he saw his dad and he, he said, today, for the first time, my father looked me right in the eye and said, who are you? And then my pastor friend said, dementia is brutal and unforgiving. Some of you know what that's like. Some of you know what it's like, how frustrating it is, how disconcerting it is to have your loved one, whether it's a parent or a grandparent or a spouse, look look right at you and forget who you are and say, who are you? It's brutal. But sometimes we wonder whether that's how God looks at us. Sometimes we wonder if that's how, if God's in fact forgotten us. After all, we can't see him. We can't talk to him and have him respond, if you will, with an audible voice. What we have is this. We have his word and where we see and hear him. And we we have these promises about salvation and forgiveness and blessing and hope. And and we look in our lives and we see progress and grace. And we see him working through providence. But but sometimes when our lives and our God's promises, they don't seem to match up. It seems as though God's forgotten us. And we might think in our heart of hearts that God's looking at us and saying, Who are you? Friend, if you feel that way this morning, then you need to hear this this part of the Bible. Because Abraham was in just your spot after 25 years of wondering whether God would or could remember his promises, whether God had in fact forgotten him. No, Abraham finally sees that God has not forgotten. He's not forgotten him. But even more, what you and I need to see this morning is God's not forgotten you. He's not forgotten you. He remembers you. He remembers you in kindness and grace. He remembers you. He sees you. He hears you. 
And though you don't seem at times to be able to hear him, and sometimes you wonder where in the world is God, listen to me this morning, God hasn't forgotten you. And he will remember to keep all of his promises towards you. How do we know? Well, we know because here in chapter 21 of Genesis, God remembered his promise about a son. Actually, the first 21 verses of this chapter are about both of Abraham's sons. The son that would be given, Isaac. The son that would be rejected, Ishmael. But behind all of these covenant promises that are made, promises that God had given to Abraham all the way back in chapter 12 is God's larger purpose of election, God's choice of Isaac through whom the blessings would come, and, and particularly the promise that God would make of his people, a great nation given a great name through Abraham's people, through God's people. All the families of the earth would be blessed. All of that's going to happen through Isaac. And indeed, after 10 chapters, where it seems as though Sarah's barrenness is, is the major obstacle to God's covenant promise, these, these first seven verses in chapter 21, you have to admit they feel a little understated, a little underwhelming. I mean, we would expect with the child of promise being born that you'd have trumpets and trombones like we had this morning, a ringing chorus, fireworks, celebration. But instead, what you have is this kind of understated account. The Lord visited. The Lord remembered, right? Verse 1, the Lord visited Sarah, as he said, and the Lord did to Sarah as he had promised. Don't, don't miss the wonder of what's going on here. Sarah had two strikes against the possibility of this happening. She was, she was infertile. And she was beyond childbearing age. And yet, though it was impossible, humanly speaking, no way she could or should conceive and bear a child, yet, yet God remembered. And she does. And in fact, there's this little word there in verse 1 that's really, really important. The Lord visited Sarah, as he had said. Which tells you that, that Sarah was able to conceive with by supernatural power, God intervened supernaturally, and that's why she can see. But that little word visited, it's important. When it shows up in your Bible, in the Old Testament, in the New, it's a signal that God is at work to advance his salvation story. He is at work to advance salvation history. He's at work to rescue and save. Think about it. Exodus chapter 4, verse 31, that little word shows up. There Moses writes, and the people believed. And when they heard that the Lord had visited the people of Israel and that he had seen their affliction, they bowed their heads and worshipped. Or again, Ruth chapter 1 and verse 6. Then Naomi arose with her daughters-in-law to return from the country of Moab. For she had heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and given them food. In the New Testament, when Zacharias sings a passage in Luke chapter 1 that we'll look at this Christmas time, he sings, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. So you see, when that word shows up, when the Lord visits, you have Exodus. You have Ruth and Boaz and the line that will produce David. You have John the Baptist and Jesus. You have the advance of the salvation story, and so it is here. The Lord visits Sarah in a supernatural way so that she might conceive and she might bring forth this child of promise. And this doesn't happen randomly. It doesn't happen by chance or luck of the draw. No, this actually happens just as the Lord said. The Lord visited Sarah as he said. And the Lord did to Sarah as he had promised. In other words, God remembered. God didn't forget. Though to Abraham and Sarah, it must have seemed as though God had forgotten. After all, it had been 25 long years since God had first appeared to Abraham and given him this glorious promise concerning a great nation and great name and blessing for all the families of the earth. In God's sight, he was right on time. You know, sometimes it seems to us as though God's awful slow in keeping his promise. 
We have these promises in God's word that he'll be a God to us and our children after us, that he will draw near to us in times of difficulty, that he will guard and keep us, and ultimately that he will rescue us, that he will rescue us beyond the grave and set things to rights again, and that Jesus will return and the dead in Christ will rise. We have these glorious promises, and it seems like they are a long time coming. Two millennia have passed since the promise of Jesus Christ coming again and the dead in Christ rising. When is God going to keep his promise? When he does, it'll be right on time. Because that's the kind of God you know and serve. He's a right on time kind of God. And if that's true for the ultimate promises, that's surely true for the promises that occur in your life. When it seems as though that the promise stretches out in front of you and you wonder, when is God going to come? When is he going to rescue? When is he going to visit? He's going to come right on time. In his perfect timing, just as he did for Sarah and Abraham. And when he shows up and it's evident that he has remembered, that he has answered their prayers, that he's moved the salvation story forward, what's the response? Well, joy and laughter and song. That's what Sarah does, verse 6. She says, God has made laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh over me. Who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. Why does she sing and laugh? She sings and laugh, laughs because God remembered. And she invites others to come and to sing and to laugh with her, to rejoice with her. Why? Because, because here's the evidence that God is a true God and a faithful God and a powerful God, a good God. He remembered. The 16th century French pastor, John Calvin, he put it this way. Moses commends the faithfulness of God as if he had said, he never feeds men with empty promises, nor is God less true in granting what he has promised than he is liberal and willing in making that promise. Did you hear it? God never feeds men with empty promises. Sometimes we eat empty calories, don't we? You know, cake, ice cream, donuts, whatever. But th those are empty calories. They don't actually sustain us. They don't actually bow us up for life in this world. In the same way, God doesn't feed us with empty promises. No, he gives us solid promises. Promises that we can bank on, we can bank our eternity upon. That's why we ought to rejoice that's why we ought to sing, worthy is the lamb, because we serve this kind of God, a God who remembers his promises and gives us solid promises to trust in. And yet, and yet as much joy as we might find in our hearts here as God remembers, or as we see how God remembers in our own lives, yet there's, there's another part of this story. We wonder, perhaps, whether God will remember Abraham in the story of Ishmael, which is what unfolds starting in verse 8. I mean, you would have thought that, that once Sarah finally had a child, she'd be copacetic, you know, kind of relaxed about life in this world. The things would be passing by her because, hey, everything's so great. I finally have a child. But actually, not so much. The scene that begins in verse 8 actually probably happened about three years later. In the ancient Near Eastern world, three years of age was a common time to wean a child. And because infant mortality was so high, uh, the number of children who actually survived to three was actually relatively few, because Isaac makes it to his third birthday, Abraham decides to throw a party. And at that big party, that's where the trouble occurs. You see it in verse 9. Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abraham, laughing. Now, we shouldn't imagine here uh, that you have you know, this little six-year-old Ishmael in the corner making funny faces at Isaac. That's not what's going on. It's likely that Ishmael is about 17 years old. Think about it. Chapter 17, when Ishmael is circumcised, we are told explicitly that he is 13. A year later would have been Isaac's birth, so 14, three years to wean, 17. So this Ishmael is a strapping young man who is laughing, but that word is more than laughing. The NIV renders it mocking, that gets closer. And the Apostle Paul, when he reflects on these scenes in, Gen in Galatians chapter 4, suggests that Ishmael was persecuting Isaac. 
So whatever is happening here with this laughing, this is more than simply giggles. This is something that's profoundly offensive, or at least offensive to Sarah. And she demands Abraham do something about it. She says in verse 10, cast out this slave woman with her son, for the son of this slave woman shall not be heir with my son Isaac. And so we see where Sarah's concern really is, not only in the mocking or persecuting or whatever is going on, but she also is saying, Ishmael cannot be an inheritor. No, Isaac is the true heir. He's the one who needs to be honored. Abraham's furious. Verse 11 says, And the thing was very displeasing to Abraham on account of his son. That's actually pretty, uh, a pretty polite way of saying it. In the Old Testament, when this Hebrew word shows up in relationship to humans, they are exploding with anger. When that Hebrew word shows up with God, somebody dies. So, so Abraham is furious. He wants to take someone's head off. And yet, though he's furious about what's going on, again, God intervenes. And you see it in verse 12. But be not displeased because of the boy and because of your slave woman. Whatever Sarah says to you, do as she tells you. For through Isaac shall your offspring be named. In other words, God has a purpose and plan. He has a purpose and plan for Ishmael too. He's going to go on to say, I will make a nation of him. The covenant promises though about a great nation, great name, blessing for all the families of the earth. They're not going to come through Ishmael. They're going to come instead through Isaac. He's both the child of promise and the chosen one. And we'll see how God watches over Ishmael in verses 15 to 21. But the, but the main thing we have to remember here is this. Namely, God remembers us, yes, but he always remembers us in the context of his larger salvation story. He, he remembers us and he remembers to keep his promises towards us so that his ongoing work of redemption might progress. In other words, God doesn't simply remember us in order to make us feel better as though he's a cosmic therapist. God, God doesn't remember us so that we will ultimately be successful and blessed like some kind of cosmic life coach. God remembers us to redeem us, but he redeems us ultimately to advance his salvation story in his world. The promises that God made to Abraham, great nation, great name, blessing for all the families of the earth, those promises are actually being realized in you. Friends, you're the great nation, a holy nation called church. You bear a great name, the name of Christian Christ. And it's through you that this world is being blessed in Jesus' name. That's why God redeemed you, after all. He redeemed you as a sign to this world of what's going to happen. Namely, that all things are being united in Christ. Things in heaven, things on earth. There's blessing for all the families of the earth through you. That's why God remembers us. He remembers us ultimately to advance his cause in his world. And so we don't miss it. The rest of this chapter, chapter 21, tells us that God remembers his promise not just about a son, but also about this land. Verses 22 to 34 describe it. When you think about it, it's a bit of a strange scene. It doesn't really feel as though this scene with Abimelech and Philco and, and Abraham goes with what goes before or what goes after. What goes before deals with Isaac and Ishmael. What comes after, as we'll see next week, is Abraham offering Isaac to the Lord. So you have these scenes in re relationship to sons, but now you have this language about land. And we're not exactly sure even how Abraham and Philco show up. Were they invited to, the, to, to Isaac's third birthday party? Did they bring a gift? I mean, was there some other catalyst involved? We're not exactly sure. It just simply says, the Bible simply says, at that time, Abraham and Philco say to Abraham, or excuse me, Abimelech and Philgo say to Abraham, God is with you in all that you do. Now therefore swear to me here that, that, God, that by God that you will not deal falsely with me or with my descendants or my posterity, but as I have dealt kindly with you, so you will deal with me and with the land where you've sojourned. What's going on here? What, Abimelech's wanting to make a military covenant, a military agreement with Abraham. Don't attack me and I won't attack you. But it's pretty clear that, that Abraham's not happy about something. 
How can you tell? Well, verse 24 is really abrupt. Abraham said, I will swear. Basically, he's saying, okay. But that's actually a clue he's bothered. Because in the ancient Near Eastern world, if you're making a covenant, there were certain things that Abraham would say in response. Similar kinds of language. That I'm swearing here before God, and so are you. That we do thus and so. And we're binding each other to these oaths. He doesn't say that. Instead, he simply says, well, okay. And then verse 25 tells you that he's really upset about something. He's upset about a well. You see it? When Abraham reproved Abimelech about a well of water that Abimelech's servants had seized, that word reproved, it has the idea of berating, complaining forcefully, repeatedly about the situation. And it's really striking because who was, who was reproving whom in the previous chapter? You remember? Back in, in Genesis 20, with the whole situation where Abraham has lied about Sarah, saying he's, she's his sister when really she's his wife, it was Abimelech who was reproving Abraham. But now the tables have turned. And now Abimelech is being reproved by Abraham, berated. And, and unlike Abraham, who agrees, well, Abimelech ends up responding pretty defensively. He goes on to say, well, it's, I'm innocent in the matter, and you should have complained earlier about it. I knew nothing about all of this. And so Abraham receives the explanations concerning this well that's been taken from him, and he takes seven ewe lambs. And as he enters into this military agreement, and Abimelech says, well, what are these ewe lambs about? Abraham says, I'm giving you these seven ewe lambs as proof that I made this well, and it belongs to me. And so Abimelech agrees, and essentially sells the well and presumably the land around it to Abraham. So what does that mean? Well, it means that after wandering around Palestine for 25 years with all of the promises concerning the land, yet not owning a single piece of the promised land, Abraham now has a stake. He has a small stake in the promised land. He has a well. Later, he's going to have a grave. And when you think about it, that's really all we have in this world, something to sustain us in a grave for us. That's what Abraham has. He's put his stake in the ground. And he has this, this marker that, that God's remembered. After 25 years of wandering through this promised land, God's kept his promise, not just concerning a son, Isaac, but also concerning this land. He owns a well. That's clearly how Abraham views this. How do I know? Because he worships. You see it in verse 33? Abraham planted a tamarisk tree in Beersheba and called there on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. First time in a while we've seen Abraham worship. What is he doing? He's saying here that the eternal one has not forgotten me. The eternal one entered space and time for my good. He's remembered me and given me a son. He's remembered me and given me a piece of land. Land God is keeping his promises. And yet we know from the rest of the Bible that Abraham wasn't simply looking for a well. He wasn't looking for a grave. And really he wasn't even looking for a 200 mile piece of dirt in the Middle East that we call Palestine. Rather, what, what Abraham was really looking for, what he was really searching for is a new world. That, that's what the writer to the Hebrews tells us. In Hebrews chapter 11, he says, that Abraham was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive, even when she was past the age, since she considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man, and him good as dead, were born descendants as many as the stars of heaven, and as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having a knowledge, they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For people who speak thus make it clear they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of the land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. For he's prepared for them a city. Do you hear it? Abraham was looking for the holy city of God. He was looking for the heavenly Jerusalem, for heaven itself to come to earth. He was looking for this world to become not just the kingdoms of men, but the kingdoms of Christ and the kingdoms of God. 
He was looking for God to keep his promise. That, that there would be a great son of Abraham who would come, who would crush the serpent's head, yes, and rule over this world, and that Abraham would participate, and in that way, all the families of the earth would be blessed. You see, he was looking, and he was still longing. He had seen God keep his promise in regards to son and land, but he was looking for yet more. And the writer of the Hebrews says he died in faith, looking forward to God keeping his ultimate promise. But you know what? You and I, we're still looking for these things. We're still looking for them, still longing for them, and we still haven't found what we're looking for. I mean, we know that Jesus has come. We know that he's the son of David, the son of Abraham. We, we know that through the cross, he's broken our bands and loosened our chains. We know that he carried the cross, but more that he died on our cross of shame, and he bore all of the sin that was ours upon himself. We know that in Jesus Christ, the kingdom of God has come and is coming. We know there's coming a day when every color will be brought into fundamental unity around the throne of Jesus Christ. And we believe that in the last day, heaven and earth will come. The dead in Christ will rise and, and we will have new bodies and we will be in the Lord's presence forever. And we will rejoice and we will sing, worthy is the Lamb to be praised. Friends, we believe all of this. But we still haven't found what we're looking for yet, have we? We're still looking forward in faith. And we might wonder, will God remember? Will he keep his promise? And yet we read the Bible. And we pray. And we come to worship on Sundays. And we try to raise our children in the faith. And we point them to Jesus Christ. And yet we still wonder. We wonder sometimes if God's forgotten, whether God will remember, whether God will keep his promises, whether God will simply look at us, having professed our faith in him, and say to us, who are you? And we despair. We feel disconcerted and frustrated. Friend, if that's you this morning, as it is me, listen to God's word. He's not forgotten you. Just as he remembered Abraham and Sarah, so he remembers you, and he remembers his promise, and he will keep them all. He can't forget. He can't forget his promise, and he can't forget you. You know why? The writer of Isaiah tells us. Because he has your name engraved in his hands. And the engraving is the form of a nail print. He won't forget you. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Almighty God, I don't know if anyone else needed to hear your word in that way this morning, but I certainly did. Lord, please grant us grace to believe that you have not forgotten, that you will remember, and you will keep your promises right on time. And Lord, we do pray Above all, that you will remind us that that soul upon Jesus is lean for repose will not be forsaken to his foes. You will keep all your promises. They are yes and amen in Jesus Christ. Give us such confidence this day when many of us are longing for hope. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.